Good morning, everyone. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning again to all my beloved Canaan members, and also welcome friends of Canaan who are participating in this online service together with us. And we look forward to an hour of great worship and hearing the Word of God together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you today we can come. What a privilege to be able to come together uh, despite the circumstance we face, uh, despite not able to meet physically together. We thank you for such an avenue where we can do so, Lord, through online, where we can still, with one heart and mind, worship you, glorifying you. Jesus, we continue to acknowledge you as our Lord and Saviour. Your name is above every name and we praise you for not only giving us salvation, you direct us to the Father's love. You allow us to know we have a good, good Father that continue to watch over us, continue to lead us and transform us uh, to you, Jesus Christ. And by the Holy Spirit, we know, Lord, we can come and allow this hour together, Lord, we worship you, we acknowledge your Lordship, and we also will prepare our hearts to receive your word for today. And we commit all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's now join our hearts together and worship God. Morning, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today, we're going to proclaim the goodness of our God in our life. Today, we're going to give Him glory and honor as we sing our worship songs. Thank you, God, because your ways are always perfect for us. Thank you for always looking after us. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, our Messiah. Let's proclaim the church. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become His righteousness. Humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Your love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Let's proclaim the church. Name above all names. Said Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescued for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Amen. Jesus, Messiah. Jesus, we sing it out. His body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out. All for the, all the trembled, and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. We sing this at church. Your love so Jesus Messiah Name above all names Blessed Redeemer Is one church, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus, Jesus, 
All I hope is in you. All I hope is in you. All the glory to you, God. The light of the world. All I hope is in you. All I hope is in you. The world. One more time, church. All I hope is in you. All I hope is in you. All the glory to you, God. The light of the world. In Jesus. Messiah, sing it out, sing it out. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescued for sinners. The ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. One more time, church. Jesus Messiah, name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescued for sinner, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Lord of all, you're the Lord of all, you're the Lord of all, Jesus, Jesus, you're the Lord of all. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we lift you up. We lift the name of Jesus in high. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you. We thank you for all the things that you've done for us. We thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you for your goodness, Father God. We thank you because all your ways are always perfect. And all we need to do is we just trust you with all our heart, Father God. Hallelujah. We proclaim your goodness in our life, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. Hallelujah. Who I heard thousand stories of what they sing your life but I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 
It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, when I sing, many searching for answers, far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are how and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To church you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to all one more time church you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, it's love so undeniable. I, I can hardly speak in peace. So unexplainable. I I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still into love Love, love, you're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you It's who I am, it's who I am It's who I am, you're a good, good father It's who you are, it's who you are It's who you are and I'm loved by you It's who I am, it's who I am it's you I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To uh, you are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To all, one more time, church. You are perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. To you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, 
It's who I am. It's who I am. Jesus, you are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. Let's just sing that song. You are perfect in all of your ways. To all, just keep on singing that church. You are perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. How and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you because no matter what happens, you're always with us. God, we thank you for your unconditional love. The love that always protects us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, Father God. Hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be praised. We give you back all the glory and honor, Father God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're here to bless your name. And gathered as your family. To praise you and proclaim your faithfulness and mercy, and we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you everything we are, and lifting our hearts and hands before you, we give you glory. And we give you honor, and we give you everything we are, lifting our hearts and hands before you, Lord. We're here to see your face and gather in your praise. In, to celebrate your grace, to praise you in your mercies, and we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you everything we are, letting our hearts and hands before you, we give you who we give you honor, who we give you everything we are, lifting our hearts and hands before you, Lord. There is no other reasons why we came than to glorify your name, for you are worthy. For our, our lives as a willing sacrifice, wholly acceptable to you. Sing it out one more time. And there is no other reasons why we came and to glorify your name, for you are worthy. We offer up our lives as a willing 
sacrifice, holy acceptable to you. And we give you glory, and we give you honor, and we give you everything we are, lifting our hearts and hands before you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you everything we are. Lifting our hearts and hands before you. We give you glory. And we give you honor. We give you everything we are. And lifting our hearts and hands before you. We give you glory. And we give you honor, and we give you everything we are, lifting our hearts and hands before you, Lord. We give you glory, we give you honor, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us pray. How wonderful, God, it is that we can worship you. Indeed, we truly want to give everything back to you, to your glory and praise unto your name. And we know, God, that uh, you are still sovereign. You are still in control of all things. And even in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we continue to see your hands at work among the people among the people in the hospital, in the government body, in the street, with many people putting their hands together to see that God, we will unite our hearts to see every possible ways and means to bring healing of the people by your name and also to able to see ways we can minimize uh, this COVID and allow us to able to come to a point where we can uh, see stability Lord, and control of this virus that we can continue life in a way Lord, that will uh, allow us to even see each other able to do things together physically Lord, as we all miss this aspect of our life so much but we continue to look to you to your will, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to uh, take time for our congregation of prayer, I want us to know that uh, even in Singapore, this is the first few days of our phase one of post-circuit breaker. For other countries, you probably have also experienced that with the lockdown uh, east, uh, and taken away uh, when people are going back to the street, going back to work with economy open, uh, we can very quickly, even in the last week or so, see countries that open their economy with people in the street begin to experience the danger of clusters of infection. People begin to find restriction again because we are just been rushing to too many things at the same time. And therefore, we learn, even from other countries, we really need to slow down and take care. So even for Singapore, as we begin to open up our economy, we want to commit to God some of the things in the screen here where we can really pray together uh, and ask that right now, as you bow your head, a short prayer for one item after another. Let's pray for this community transmission of COVID-19 to remain low. Thank God, Singapore is even experiencing uh, low infection numbers. And we want to pray that it will be kept that way. Ask God for His mercy. Though we have low community spread, we cannot deny that we have 
quite a high number of our migrant workers being infected, especially in the dormitories. And therefore, let's continue to pray that this, there will be decrease in the numbers and those infected, may they continue to find healing grace. And we all can imagine families are worried overseas, back home for them. Let's pray for comfort. Let's pray for peace. Would you do that? to be able to be careful even from phase one that we hope we can get to phase two and then phase three we really need to pray that every one of us continue to be socially responsible to ensure minimal risk so let's pray for that Just as in any other country, scientists are all rushing to find a vaccine for treatment. And therefore, let's continue to pray the vaccine and any treatment of such uh, may be found soon. God, we know with COVID or any other situation, troubles that we may be in, we know that Jesus has overcome all this by His death and His resurrection. And we know, Lord, Jesus is the answer to all things as we look to Him and find healing and find answer and find strength in Him. And we thank you, Lord, that this moment when we prepare our hearts to partake in the communion, we know communion is a special reminder of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. The bread representing the broken body for our sins, the cup representing the blood of Christ that cleanses us and forgives us of our sins, all so that, Lord, we can be made whole in every way, coming under the Lordship of Christ. So we may not have all the answer to the world's problem, the current COVID issue, but we know God that you are in control. And therefore, even as we take time to meditate, to partake in this communion, you will give us the peace the strength and the faith to look to you always that you will lead us through and that we will continue to be strong because we continue to come under your Lordship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's get our bread ready. Pause for a moment to let the Spirit lead us to seek God for whatever we are experiencing now. But always learn to say, thank you, Lord. You will lead me through. Jesus, when he instituted the communion in his last supper, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together.
after the bread, the cup, Jesus said, This cup is the blood in my covenant. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink this cup together. Thank you, Lord. What a privilege again to be able to use the communion as a reminder again of who you are, what you have done for us. So help us, O oh God, to continue to look to you in all we are, in all we do, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now is the time that I like to encourage and remind us about our tithes and offering to the Lord through the church we are in. And now uh, there are many ways to do so. I'd like you to uh, do it, uh, even maybe not now, but any time in the week, uh, please continue to give to the Lord. But for those of us who really do not want to forget, at the end of the service, we will again display the screen of the tithing and offering uh, barcode you can just take your time to do so right after the service. All right, thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to go into the Word and uh, let's bow our head again to allow God to uh, lead us through the Word. Yes, God, thank you that we have this privilege. Even in the east of our very home to watch the online service. But we pray, God, that uh, we are not here just to watch a show or to be entertained in any way that would make us feel good. But we're here to learn to hear your word, seek your word, and reflect upon your word. May you just help us to do that this morning and allow me, God, that you will use me, your mouthpiece, to bring forth the sermon series beginning in chapter 1 of Philippians so that, Lord, as we, everyone, wherever we are, were to follow the scripture and the expounding of what this scripture means and what, how we can apply in our life, may your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to start our sermon series on Philippians with chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. I have entitled uh, today's message, Real Joy in Biblical Fellowship. Last week, Pastor Larry has done an excellent job introducing to us the book of Philippians. And we know that the main theme of this book is rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. And uh, you need to continue to remember that uh, as uh, he, uh, Pastor Larry reminds us that the book is actually about encouraging us, helping us to learn to rejoice, helping us to know that we can have joy in the Lord even in the midst of our difficult circumstances or any circumstances as a matter of fact. And uh, we can do so with this joy when we learn to be grounded in living for Christ and be rooted in the preaching of the gospel. So as we begin chapter 1, the few first few verses here, you're going to look together with me how we can actually discover real joy, not just happiness that is often based on circumstance, but real joy despite the circumstance that we all are facing today. And therefore, I want you to look together with me this idea of having real joy through Biblical fellowship. Now, what exactly is fellowship? And I'm quite sure many of us uh, uh, may think we are familiar with. But what I want to help us this morning to look beyond what we normally think what fellowship is about, that I'm going to show us and help us to see from the text here that we can actually experience real joy in biblical fellowship. Do you want that? Then listen on. Now, I put here what is our common understanding of fellowship. 
we love fellowship. I love fellowship. But honestly, when I think about fellowship, I think about food. Don't you? And because somehow in our church uh, uh, today, whenever, you know, we use terms like, let's have our Christian fellowship, let's do food fellowship, somehow it has ingrained in our hearts and mind that fellowship has something to do with fun, food, fellowship. So when people gather together, especially young people gather together, fellowship means having a game, uh, you know, computer games together, challenging, uh, see who is the best, you know. We think having a game together, whether it's online or physically, is fellowship. And of course, when we do games together, we have a good time together, that is a good, fun fellowship. Of course, the main thing, we can't escape this fact. We think about food, we think about fellowship. We think food equal fellowship. We eat together and when we have a nice meal together, we say, what a wonderful fellowship we have. And for some people, fellowship simply means uh, able to just come together uh, as friends, just sitting together and talk about anything and everything under the sun. Is that your understanding too about fellowship? But today, I want you to see from the scripture, fellowship actually is more than just fun food and eating and talking under the sun. It's far more than that. And of course, there's nothing wrong for us to have fun and food and talking anything under the sun. But I want to rediscover from the Bible what is the actual meaning of fellowship that we will learn to experience that in order for us to experience real joy, not temporary happiness because of friends that we have uh, together in eating or having fun, but real fellowship, real joy that is from within. And you're going to see that very quickly. So first of all, let me tell you what is biblical fellowship. You know, I think about fellowship, I can't help but to look at Acts 42 to begin with. Acts 2.42. They say that, that, that wrote this, that after the day of Pentecost, when the disciples gathered together with 3,000 other new converts, straight away, the very verse came out that said, they devoted themselves, all the people of God, all the new converts, they devoted themselves to what? Four things. Apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. And when I look, we look at this verse again, fellowship especially, when I re look at the context of Acts 2 again about what they do when they devote themselves together, I can't help but to see very clearly, and I hope you do see now, that when you put fellowship along with these uh, weight, weighted words like apostles' teaching, breaking of bread and prayer, I cannot imagine fellowship has, is just confined or, or focused on just fun food alone. In fact, I think the fellowship has nothing to do with fun and food. And when I look at the immediate context of Acts 2, when they gather together to do all these things, the expression of it is they were together, that is okay, that's for sure, but they are together not to eat and drink alone. They are together for a common purpose. They serve the poor and needy. They were evangelizing. The church is growing because everybody is having something in common and I believe one of the common things they have is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when I look further in the word fellowship in other scripture, in the New Testament especially, verse from, from book after book, and I look at the word fellowship, it certainly did not give me any impression that fellowship is simply about gathering together, having a fun time, having a food time, and talking anything under the sun. And in fact, if we do a word study, the fellowship has deeper meaning than that. So I concluded that from this little study of fellowship, that the church is not just about building community. The kind of fellowship that we think about perhaps is better used in terms of community, friendship, bonding, community together. But the church is not just about building community. The church is about committing to the proclamation of the gospel. The way I see fellowship is linked uh, in all the different contexts of the Bible. 
So do understand, fellowship has a more deeper meaning. And we're going to look more into that. And, and here, let's also understand, see from Paul's perspective, what is Paul's understanding of fellowship? If you, we're going to read verses 1 to 11, you will discover very quickly, Paul has a very close relationship with the church in Philippi. Very, very close. But I want you to know his closeness is not because they have been eating and having fun together for years. No. Paul was so close to them, not because of the time they spent together. In fact, if you read Acts 16, which is the foundation for Philipp Philippian uh, letter, where Paul started the first church in Philippi, when you read Acts 16, you realize that actually Paul may have only spent a couple of months with this new small church. A couple of months would not make any great fellowship time and the kind of closeness that you're going to read about Paul. And in fact, Paul may not, perhaps not seen them for years until when the letter was written that we're going to read uh, that's in the New Testament. It could be very well be like 10 years later that Paul wrote them this letter partly because of the thanksgiving of the gift that they sent to him. So what I'm trying to say is that the closeness that you read about Paul's love for the people of Philippi, the church in Philippi, is not because they have years of bonding, community spirit, eating and drinking and having food together. No, there's something more. There's a deep connection that makes Paul feel so joyful, filled with thanksgiving and with love and prayer for the church. And you know what that is? It's called partnership. Partnership. Everybody say with me, partnership. I couldn't hear you. Could we say three times louder, as Pastor Brian would say, three times louder, partnership. Okay, that sounds better. Now, the word partnership, in case you do not know, and it's a good word that is translated from the Greek word koinonia. I think many of us have been taught by the pastor, koinonia means fellowship. And unfortunately, the fellowship that we think about is fun and food mostly. But the, actually, the word koinonia has a deeper meaning of the word fellowship that we think of. And a better translation, one of them is called partnership, rightly translated in Philippines, in Philippians letter. So partnership, like fellowship that we, uh, that we all know now, is simply a shared relationship not just in fun and food, but a fellowship that, that has this contribution, that has this participation to a common cause. And the common cause, again, is not fun and food. The common cause in this context is about partnership in the gospel of Christ. That is exactly what I want you to understand. So with this background and understanding, I want to read us the 11 verses to give you a feel of what Paul wanted the people of Philippi, the church in Philippi, to know about his heart and his appreciation of them. Let's look at the board. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent 
and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Beautiful start of his letter to the church at Philippi. Scholars will often say the first 11 verses are like a summary of what he will write in the next three, four chapters of his letter. So here we are getting a very broad idea of what Paul wanted to communicate to the church in Philippi, whom you can sense and read that he missed so much, he loved so much, he yearned to see them so much. And by the time this letter is written, it's almost like about 10 years since he founded the little church in Philippi. So again, the question that I raised that will help us to think about this text is, how do we experience real joy in biblical fellowship? How do we experience real joy in true biblical fellowship? And may I propose to you this morning that we can do so when we engage in the furtherance of the gospel through our partnership with one another. Very simple. And I'm going to show you very quickly and simply from the letter itself three ways we can engage in partnership. And I assure you, when you follow along in principle and apply it in your life, in your church life, these three ways, I can assure you, you're going to have real joy, not just happiness, real joy in the Lord that lasts for a long, long time to come. So first of all, I want to suggest to you, to part, when we talk about partnership, we are talking about serving together. Serving together. You read just now, Paul said, from the first day until now, you have been partnering with me. And what does that mean? When he talked about first day to now, we all can agree that uh, Paul probably will have thought about the very first time he came to the city of Philippi. Philippi was perhaps the the main city in Macedonia, uh, the, perhaps the first province in Europe that he started to reach out with the gospel of Christ. Philippi is a Roman colony. And when Paul entered into Philippi because of the prompting of the Holy Spirit that you learned from the introduction, he began like his usual way of church planting, look for synagogue uh, uh, to, to preach the gospel to the Jewish people first. But he found no synagogue, but some ladies along the riverbank and talking. And there he made his first move by sharing the gospel with them. And uh, I'm sure he remembered that since he talked about the first day until now, that one of the very first converts that he had was this businesswoman called Lydia, a woman uh, doing business with purple cloth. Uh, and uh, if you read the story from Acts 16, you realize the leader not only was the first convert, he was so excited about the gospel and, and she actually invited Paul Silas uh, to her house to stay and then we believe that through her house began the first home fellowship, the home Bible study group, whatever you call it, to able to allow the gospel of Christ to continue to be taught from a home to a lot of people. I like to think Paul probably would be thinking about Lydia as one who partner with him. Another person who partner with Paul is through the person called Epaprotitus, uh, sent by the church to be Paul's himself called fellow worker and soldier. He probably was Paul's attendant, attending to Paul's need, helping Paul, maybe carrying his bag, sharing whatever Paul want him to share and, and so on and so forth. In fact, uh, he may not be the main preacher, but certainly we can see that he was involved in the work of Paul. And, and the Bible tells us that he is such a hardworking man that even he works, he labors so hard that, you know, later in the chapter, you realize that he fell sick and almost died, that he had to be sent back to the church again. But we have an example of a worker who, who went along with Paul to help Paul in the ministry of proclaiming the gospel. And you can tell Paul 
appreciate this partnership so much because this is not like a one-time partnership, a one-off partnership, a one-time mission trip, a one-time opening of home. It's a long haul from the first day until now, meaning it could be a stretch of 10 years. They were still doing that. So here I want to know engage in partnership is, may not have to be just talking about uh, proclaiming the gospel itself, but partnership can be working together towards the goal of the gospel. You may not be able to preach now like Paul. You may not be able to uh, do any direct uh, sharing of the gospel. But partnership show us here that if we do whatever we can that has something to do with helping people to know God, you are in partnership of the gospel. So as I think about this, I'm very thankful. I think about even our church. I think about the many homes that are open for our cell group, small group to some of us, you may call it. I'm so thankful for, for members who open your home for cell group, allowing your home to be a place where we can study the Bible together, we can share, we can pray together. And I want you to know, opening up a home is one way you are partnering in the gospel and you will be blessed by doing so. So I want to say thank you for doing so. There are many other ways we can serve together in partnership. You can partner by serving as usher. Usher is a very important job because you are actually a frontline person with all your smile and joy inside you. Facilitate welcoming somebody to the church, to the cell group, to the church, to the building, before they even hear the gospel, they feel the warmth and love of your service. Can you see how important your job can be? And we know we have so many ushers for working for years. And I just want to say again, thank you. You can be serving in many other areas, even like mission. Mission committee, for example. You, you are planning, you are facilitating, you are publicizing. And this may not be, you think, doing the gospel itself, but you're partnering in the work of helping people to come to God by your serving. So I want you to know partnership may not have to be direct proclamation of gospel, but anything that helps work towards proclaiming the gospel, you are in partnership and you want to really do so, serving God in whatever way so that you know that you truly will find joy in the Lord by doing so. I want to do something different that we always do in, that we normally don't do in preaching. But since it's online, I want to give you about 20 to 30 seconds. I'm going to ask you with what I've said so far. I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to pause and, and ask the Lord, even right now. I believe the Holy, if you are listening, if you're seeking God, Holy Spirit is speaking to you now. What area or areas of commitment can I make as part of serving together in partnership of the gospel? What areas of commitment can I make as part of serving together in partnership of the gospel? Let the Holy Spirit prompt you. Don't be afraid. You may be, huh? That's me? You want me to do that? But maybe God challenged you today. Partnership bring new, real joy. Would you commit to the Lord? So with whatever God has spoken to you that comes from inside you to say, I think I want to commit to serve this area. Later, when we have a chance to speak to the pastor or even uh, uh, in some other ways, then maybe we can see how we can commit ourselves uh, by telling someone how we can be really involved. Okay, secondly, how to engage in partnership. Not everybody likes to hear this. We can do so by suffering together. Suffering together. Because when you read verse 7 just now, Paul said, you are partaker with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confession of gospel. The word partaker, again, though written different in Greek, has a root word in Greek, the same thing meaning participation, meaning partnership. So what Paul again is emphasizing, you not only part, 
uh, partner me, with serving me, with opening a home, with people coming along to help me with my needs and so on and so forth, you actually partake in the proclamation of gospel itself. So not just about serving towards the goal, you are in it. And he, and he was so thankful. And, and, and how I know it is in it, because later in verse 29, you read that not only do they just sympathize, oh Paul, I'm so glad that you are suffering f- uh, for the sake of gospel, allowing us to know the good news, but then you yourself are imprisonment and so on and so forth. No, the Bible says in verse 29, they suffered for his sake. In other words, not only did they see Paul suffer, persecuted because of the gospel, they themselves are also persecuted. And understandably so, because Roman colony at that time uh, advocated emperor worship. You are in this colony, you worship the emperor. And the idea of not having a synagogue then shows that they are very much confined to Think about worshipping the Roman emperor. And now that they've discovered Jesus Christ to be the Lord whom they shall only worship, could you see the tension? You are, your faith needs to choose God or emperor to worship. And I'm sure many of them begin to seek allegiance to God. And that's why they suffer like Paul would have. And Therefore, here, show us the partnership is not just about supporting, serving. It's also about very directly involved to the point even of suffering. Now, I know in Singapore, maybe some part of the Philippines that uh, we we all come to know, uh, we cannot talk much about suffering, even talk in proclamation of the gospel, isn't it? I mean, we are quite a free country. We don't really suffer physically, tortured, persecuted, put to prison, imprisonment, uh, prisons for that purpose. We don't suffer in that way, obviously. But in our own country context, I want us to also think that we can also quote unquote suffer for the gospel. For many of us, suffering uh, quote unquote uh, could be, be disowned by our family. Don't you have that? We have many people like that, disowned by our family, disinherited by our family because now that you want to become a Christian, I won't give you a single cent. Right? Some of us face that. Some of us are humiliated by our friends, by our classmates, by our colleagues. Some of us are disowned in many ways, uh, be unfriended by many people. Some of us uh, experience uh, uh, even... This suffering, not just alone, but we actually experience suffering together. Have you, do you remember, uh, you know, I also have, when some churches stand up for the truth of God, they actually uh, uh, have the church been put together uh, uh, by other people attacking the church, uh, mocking the church, and you as a member of the church will come under it. So there, there is this suffering that we all, can uh, imagine, may not be persecution like physical, real torture, but in some way of suffering. But we just want to be realistic here. When you proclaim the gospel, we may, we may experience some suffering. After all, if the gospel is good news, the gospel is also an offense to arm some other people, as the scriptures say. So again, in the short time, I want to think, in what way am I willing to pay the price in partnership of suffering together towards proclaiming the gospel. The third thing I'm going to share with you in partnership is about this idea of sharing together. No church, Paul said, share me with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So in other words, the Philippi church had been taught well and understood when you talk about proclaiming the gospel, you cannot just talk about, just talk, but you have to show forth even by giving financial support to the mission. Uh, and because simply mission, ministry need money. Don't go away with the, and the idea that go in faith, God will bless you, He will supply your need and then you did not do a thing. 
ministry, mission, need money. So Philippi Church knew that and they have been giving to Paul now and then. And, and one of the key reasons why Paul wrote this letter is to thank them for the gift that he had been receiving from them. And, and therefore, here I pause to say, I'm so privileged to have, I, I, I have the privilege to see many of our members, besides giving to the church and the mission, whenever there's a need of mission, mission work, evangelism work, they too will be willing to pour out extra offering to give. Because I believe this member understand when we talk about partnership, you cannot go away thinking uh, we don't need to give money. Money can be a very important part of helping in the mission. So again, a question to think about. Apart from giving to mission through our church, how can I invest in reaching pre-believers and other missions as part of sharing together in partnership for the sake of the gospel? So, I can assure you, church and friends, we can experience real joy in biblical fellowship by engaging in furtherance of the gospel through our partnership with one another by serving together, by suffering together, by sharing together. And I can tell you, as Paul has said, you can find this assurance that, that as Paul has said in verse 6, I want you to know that it is whatever partnership uh, ways that you are doing, I want you to know something. It is not you who are doing it. It is actually God who is doing it through you. Because Paul recognised that. He appreciates Philippi Church for doing what they are doing, but he know very surely the reason why they could do it because God was behind it. And we, he has this assurance as we can that it is God who began the work in us and it is He who will bring the completion. And so just take note of that. God is the one who brings you through. You, you, so in your serving, in your suffering, in your sharing, you can be assured God knows and He will bring this beautiful good work into completion so as to bring glory to God the Father. That's why Paul ends with the scripture that tells us that he is praying for them. The verses that we have read, now I'm going to do this as we close our time together. Instead of just seeing what Paul is praying for them, I want us to use the very prayer to pray for ourselves that whatever we are doing, the ultimate of doing uh, partnership is not just about proclaiming the gospel. The end goal is not just receiving the gospel. The end goal is after we receive the gospel, we are able to grow in Christ, to maturity in Christ, so that we become the bride of Christ that will be ushered in into the heavenly, all for one end goal in mind. That is to the glory and praise of God the Father. So let's close our time together. I'm going to lead us to pray. So everyone, wherever you are, let's pray this together out loud. All right, let's pray. Father God, this is my prayer, that my love will grow more and more, that I will have knowledge and understanding with my love, that I will see the difference between what is important and what is not, and choose what is important, that I will be pure and blameless for the coming of Christ, that my life will be full of many good works, that are produced by Jesus Christ to bring glory and praise to you. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody say, Amen. All right. Thank you for your participation in this online service. God bless you. I'll see you again uh, in our next online service. God bless. <laughs>